Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's Surface Measurement Systems online webinar. Today we will be exploring the topic Experimental Methods for Measuring Vapour Pressures of Chemical Substances. We are lucky enough today to have our very own Dr Vladimir Martis delivering today's presentation. Our resident expert in vapour pressures, Dr Vladimir Martis is the DVS Product Manager for Porous Materials and Vacuum product specialist at Surface Measurement Systems. He received his master's degree in materials engineering from Trenchen University of Alexander Dubček in Slovakia in 2004. He received his engineering doc doctorate degree in molecular modeling and material simulation from the chemistry department at the University College of London in 2012. Since joining SMS, Dr. Martis has continued working on the development of advanced in situ experimental surface science techniques using molecules as probes instead of X-rays for studying catalysts, zeolites, MOFs, polymers, freeze and spray dried materials, composites and glasses under relevant industrial conditions. Dr. Martis has authored several papers in peer-reviewed journals and presented at several international conferences. Uh, now, before we pass over to Dr. Martis to begin his presentation, I just want to remind everyone of a few housekeeping rules uh, before we proceed. Um, if you could all keep your mics muted for the duration of the presentation, please, just to avoid any feedback from anyone else's end. And as you may know, at the end of today's session, we'll have a live Q&A with Dr. Martis, so you can pose any questions you have for, on this topic and any other questions that arise from the presentation. You can submit these questions in one of two ways. You can submit them in writing at the questions tab where I will pick them up and ask Martis in person at the Dr. Martis in person at the end of the session. Or alternatively, you can raise your hand and at the end of during the live QA, I will uh, let you know when you can unmute your microphone and you can ask Dr. Martis your question yourself. So just to reiterate, you can submit your question for us to ask in the questions tab in writing, or you can ask the question yourself over your mic just by raising your hand and waiting for us to call you up. So without further ado, I will hand the control over to Vladimir to begin his presentation. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, John. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for dialing in this afternoon. Now you should be able to see my screen. <clears throat> yes, we can, Vlad. Thank you, John. Yes. So thank you once again. Thank you very much for dialing in today and joining this afternoon webinar about exploring the experimental methods for vapor pressure measurements. So first, I can just give short introduction to the vapor pressures. It's just one slide, is quite busy. So basically, let me define first the vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure is defined as the pressure exerted by vapor in thermodynamic equilibrium in this condensed phase. Uh, the given temperature in your cold system. This can be the, as a sample, as a substance can be the solid or liquid. The value of the vapor pressure are then used to calculate the heat vaporization or evaporation sublimation. Now, the vapor, vapor pressure of a substance at a certain experimental temperature is usually characteristic of material, which can be defined by its uh, properties like molecular mass, melting point, and boiling point. Uh, the vapor pressure doesn't really depend on the amount of uh, liquid or solid samples. As long as we can use only a small amount of liquid or gas specimen, because that's going to be only the present in equilibrium with this vapor phase. Typical applications for vapor pressures are either the environmental or human health protection uh, vapor pressure deposition processes, lubricants in semiconductors, vacuum industry, heat transfer fluids, fragrance formulation, photovoltaic production processes, aerospace and automotive industry. Now, let's move on to my next slide, where I'm going to explain the vapor pressure of liquid what it is. So let me give you an example in which you have a already observed the phenomena of vapor pressure at home. So we all heated up the pan, filled it with the water, and with the clothes lid on the top on a gas cooker. And many times you forget about it. So you are in the middle of something, you're doing something else. And what you observe 
you hear some rattling noise from uh, you hear some rattling lid and the hot water is spilling out of the cooker. So what we observe here is a form of the thermo, thermodynamic point of view is the we observing that the liquid is heated up and its molecule obtain enough kinetic energy to overcome uh, pulses holding them the liquid and they try at the escaping into the gas phase. So during the during, during this during this process, what's happening as they're escaping, they generate enough pressure to move the lid up, which allows the vapor to escape. So, and the, as the vapor show, so once these uh, gas molecules form, which creates the population of molecules in the gas phase, in the vapor phase above the liquid, they produce a pressure. And the pressure is the, and this is called the vapor pressure of the liquid. Now, the other important parameter is the relationship between volatility and the boiling point. So, volatility describing generally how readily a substance vapor. So we have the table here, which shows uh, different compounds, varying from boron to hydrogen. But, but what we see, what we can see from these tables is as the boiling point goes going down, the volatility goes up. So hydrogen is very highly, highly volatile compared to let's say mercury, and which is the, less, uh, the least volatile. And one of the use of the mercury was in the manometers, in the U-tube shape manometers, because the vapor pressure of the mercury is about like 0 0.0017 or at 25 degrees Celsius. As you know, the vapor pressure is also strongly correlated with the temperature. So the vapor pressure exponentially rise with increasing the temperature. And if you use a natural logarithmus, to express this as only a relationship as a linear, we can use this Clausian Kleppen equation where LNP is equal to my, uh, heat vaporization, the vaporization, or the universal gas constant R and temperature T, and the C is the slope intercept, is the constant for the equation. Now, there are several methods to measure the vapor pressure. So, here we're looking at the table which was produced by OECD guideline showing different uh, methods for the vapor pressure. So you have the dynamic method, static method, or the diffusion method, or gravimetric method. In these talks, and each of these methods got its own certain uh, recommended range, and also the reproducibility range, whether they're suitable for liquids and uh, solid. Now in these talks, I'm gonna focus mainly on, uh, that's an effusion method, which is can be applied, which is applicable in the range 10, how minus 15 Pascal up to 100 Pascal, and the static method, which is direct measurements of the vapor pressure, which can be applied in the vapor pressure range from 100 to 100,000 Pascal. The reason we have to use these two methods in order to cover whole vapor pressure range, because which are shortly, you won't be able to, if the effusion rates or the evaporation rates is very high, then you won't be able to use the natural effusion method because your sample is going to evaporate fast, completely before you'll be actually able to measure. So let's start with the natural effusion method. So the natural effusion method, it's a gravimetric method. So what it means, so we're using the thermal balance to measure the effusion rates of molecule into the vacuum. In this measurement, sample is held in a small uh, nuts and cell, which is called nuts and cell, which is a small orifice, and the molecule escaping uh, through the orifice into the water. Now, this tells is a place inside to the metal pan, and then this the metal pan is hanged from the ultra balance onto the hang down wire. So what we measure during these measurements is the constant mass loss. Or, and as you know, the effusion rate or evaporation rate that is a proportionally uh, is proportional to the actual vapor pressure of material. 
So we continuously measure the mass loss of the sample during this uh, process. So as you can see, uh, as a function of the time, uh, the constant temperature, what you see, we observe in the muscle, which is usually the linear. So what these nut cell cell look like? So on the picture here on the top, we have the lid, and uh, with a small orifice size, and at the bottom is the cups, where it's going to be placed your powder, solid, or a liquid. On the right side, you have the inside of you. So once you load the sample, uh, we screw the lid on top of the cup, and we place the nuts and cell into the metal pan and then we hang it directly from the hang wire which is suspended from the ultra balance and this is also all placed inside the vacuum chamber and then we just pull the vacuum so during the measurements we continuously weigh the sample and we measure the muscles rate under the high vacuum at the different uh, temperatures so how we can calculate the vapor pressure of material from the nascent effusion bed? So you expose the sample to a certain temperature. Basically, temperature, the temperature in a closed environment, temperature defines, defines your evaporation rate. And from this evaporation rate, which is expressed as DMDT value, we can calculate the vapor pressure using classic Clapeyn equation. So the cal for calculation of vapor pressure, we're going to use this equation on the right. And for for this, we need to have knowledge of the molecular weight of the sample. So this is very important. The surface area or the orifice and the DMDT value or the evaporation rate, which is obtained from these thermogravimetric measurements and different temperatures. So the DMDT value is obtained at least for five different temperatures. And during these measurements, we obtain linear mass loss. And then we feed that value here and we automatically calculate the vapor pressure of the solid at a certain at a experimental temperature. Now for this method, we're using the apparatus, which is a wave called vapor pressure analyzer. So what we have here, so we have the temperature enclosure, which allows us to control the temperature in the temperature range between 10 to 80 degrees. Inside we have the vacuum stand, and under the dome here we have ultra has been just spending hanging down wire and on the left hand side we have the sample so in this case the sample is placed inside the nuts and uh, fusion cell or oh, right hand side is the reference to count the the sample side and this is connected to the vacuum line and at the end of the vacuum line we have the set of the turbo molecular pump and the rotary pump to maintain a very high vacuum and the pressure is measured using the vacuum pressure gauge so this, this is the typical setup for this measurement now, some of the samples, especially the oils, they're not going to evaporate at low temperatures, below 80. So if we have this kind of samples, what we do, we increase the temperature of the sample locally up to, let's say, 400 degrees, and we measure the evaporation rates at different temperatures, let's say, from 80 up to 300 degrees Celsius. This the develop the temperature at each temperature, at least for two or three hours. So this is the typical setup for the measurements of uh, that's and effusion method. So here's just a brief picture of the system. What we have here is the set of the pumps, here's the temperature enclosure, and inside is the vacuum system. It's a fully automated system controlled by PC, where we run just automated method to run the measure, uh, different measurements. So let's move to the example of the NASA, uh, NASA data. So system is usually calibrated using a reference material like benzoic acid, because its vapor pressure is well known. So in typical experiments, so once you load the sample into the and cell, we pull high vacuum and then we expose the sample to different temperatures and we wait at, the at each temperature for several hours. So in this case, we waited about eight, three hours at each stage. So I call each of these temperature steps a stage. So solid line is from the incubator, solid yellow is from the preheater. So in this case, the preheater is just measuring the temperature of the sample under the nuts and so. And what you observe, as you expect, as we increase in the temperature, the effusion rate or the evaporation of uh, rates of the molecule is uh, faster. Now, and from this data now, so then you have the evaporation rates at different temperatures. From this data now, we can calculate using the equation, which I showed earlier, vapor pressure of the benzoic acid at different temperatures. Now, as we do this, we automatically calculate the heat or vaporization using classic equation. Uh, and then here we get logarithms of vapor pressure versus 
less temp uh, temperature. So you expect the heat vaporization for basic acid is about 88, uh, uh, 88 kilo. about between 88 and 87 uh, kilopascal. Kilo now, so what's the absolute value of, uh, of the vapor pressure for this material? So it, the experimental range was between 30 to 60 degrees. We have the evaporation rates in the column, marked as the MVT. We have the vapor pressures obtained by using our let's say, diffusion method in this column here. And then vapor pressure is the uh, start. As you can see, there is a really good agreement between measured vapor pressures and uh, vapor pressures obtained from the literature of the publications. And also noted the vapor pressure size of the which was in this case, it was 167 micro. So we have the cells with different sizes of the orifice. And this is important depending on the type of material you use for evaporation rates we expect. So if you have highly volatile materials, you want to use a small orifice size when you have a let's say material which is less volatile and we also want to use a higher quality size to get a good data. Our next example is so basically the data are automatically calculated uh, using our uh, by using our analysis software. So in this case we generate the report and absolute value which is provides you all the vapor pressure value in the Pascal as well uh, heat of vaporization in the Jupiter. So this all automatically. Now I move to do some examples. Let's say vapor pressure of naphthalene. So you might be you might be familiar with naphthalene. You know that we used to have it to, to keep the coals uh, fresh. So basically, the vapor pressure is at 25 degrees. Is a nice linear evaporation rate. Is about 11.8 pascal. And the rate of production agency reports 11.6 pascal. So very good. Idea. Now another example of these uh, methods is for vapor pressure of the soil like pesticides and fungicide. So these are environmental. To, uh, for to tackle the environmental issues, so we look at the four different pesticides: uh, ametrine, bifetrine, pyrophorac, and azoxystrobin. And again, that's in a method, and the literature values are in very good agreement. And you can go down to 8.7, about uh, 110 minus 10. So again, so it's just example of one of these uh, mass data here. So it's very useful method. Again, another. Interesting application the vapor pressure of the greases or lubricating oils. And this is mainly for the vacuum uh, palm oil. So, and it may because the function is, is for lubrication, cooling, corrosion protection, oxidation. And one of the comments is the low vapor pressures. Because if you have pressures for the vapor, especially the training, it's going to cause the issue with the process. So, here look at the by vapor pressure of the oil A. So, what we see here, we have the first, we have the effusion rate on the top graph when we're increasing the temperature. We go from 80 all the way up to 230 degrees. That is showing the solid yellow line, and the massless rate or evaporation rate are showing a solid red line. What you observe at low temperatures, it, we can't measure this vapor pressure because it's so low. So the system, the microbial is not able to detect it. And then once the temperature is increased above 100 degrees, so it will be, we, are, uh, we are able to calculate the vapor pressure of this material, and it's the plot of vapor pressure for this oil. Same story applies to the same oil, but is the vapor, called vapor of oil C. Again, the vapor, in this case, the vapor pressure measuring range for this oil had to be increased up to 200 degrees, and the, the measurements were done from 200 degrees to 260 degrees. So, in order to get a good evaporation rate. So, as, as you can see, it's very important to find the right temperature. So, the vapor pressure, when you extrapolate the vapor pressure to 20 degrees, the value goes down to and minus uh, 15 Pascal. Now, the other implication is vapor pressure of sealant. So here, look at the silicon vapor pressure. And what you observe here, it is the other opposite. So in this case, you want to go to lower temperatures because the evaporation rates are quite high at 25 degrees, as you can see here from the evaporation rates on the left hand right. So at 25 degrees, you have very high evaporation rate. Then you get to 30 degrees. The change in evaporation is only small. And at 35, so also this, there's no significant change in evaporation rate. But when you increase the temperature all the way to 40 degrees, the sample completely evaporated. So there's nothing left in the pan. So, and, but we were still, so in the small amount of temperature range between 25 and 35 degrees, we were able to calculate the pressure of this uh, silicon 
which was about 3.3 Pascal at 25 degrees. Uh, the other, the other the application is the vapor pressure of basic chemicals, like stabilizers, uh, neutralizers. So here we look at the vapor pressure of, uh, of uh, three isopropanol amine. And again, it was me measured for narrow temperature range from 40 to 90 degrees. It was basically higher up to temperature. And then we were able to evaporate extra fluid value for 20 degrees, which was about 0.006 Pascal. Now, so that was all done for the nuts and uh, fusion method, the gravity metric method. Now I'm going to move to the static method. So static method is a little bit uh, different. So static method, we're going to look at the evaporation and condensation in a closed system. So, so what we're going to do here, so on the, on the left-hand side, uh, we have the system. We have the flask uh, filled in with the water, connected with the pressure gauge, and on the top uh, we have a thermometer. Okay, so what we measure here, so this is a static method, so there is no moving part. So static, or so in a closed system means that air cannot coming in and water uh, cannot go out at the same. So inside the flask, the water cannot come. Uh, come out and air cannot come in. So this means closed systems are completely isolated. That's why we have this uh, stop on the top is a thermometer and it's connected to closed cage. So initially, so when you pour the water, close the valve, we measure the pressure of the dry air in the flask. So the pressure is almost zero. So the rate of evaporation is almost non-existent. Now, if we set the temperature to 20 degrees, the rates of evaporation will, in, uh, will increase. So we have the water molecules escaping from the liquid and they start, and when there is enough evaporation, then some of the molecules, then they will start condensation. So the evaporation, so the, the, the rates of condensation in this case, will be defined by the rates of uh, evaporation. And you know, in, in general, what we have here, the evaporation will be greater than the rate of condensation for the liquid water. So once what we see here, after a while, so we will be observed to measure the vapor pressure, the vapor pressure of the liquid. So as you can see, the, now the bagage moved. And as a result, the rate of the condensation is increasing. Now, what we're observing, once we reach the, the rate of evaporation and condensation, we reach the dynamic equilibrium. And, uh, and that dynamic equilibrium, the both rates are, will be equal. Okay, so this is the, how we're gonna measure it. And at some point, we will saturate because it's the closed system. So we're going to measure the saturation pressure of water inside this uh, system. So now, how are we going to do this uh, experimentally? So for this, we have the, I show the, show the schematic of the static vapor pressure apparatus, which is very similar to what you saw in the previous picture. So basically what you have, you have the liquids uh, filled in in the flask. So the vapor pressure is a zero. So the vapor pressure to the, to the vapor, the liquid might start evaporate at some uh, point after a few minutes. And all this is inside the temperature control enclosure. This is very, very important because the temperature enclosure describes your evaporation rate at a certain temperature, let's say 25 degrees. Then we have the chamber, small chamber, when you have uh, isolated by such sort of valves. And then if you measure the increase in the pressure, so when we open the valve, we measure the increase in the pressure inside this vacuum chamber using two pressure sensors, 10 to 100,000 to. And all this is just to a terrible molecular part. So what's happening here, prior to the experiments, we remove the air. So this, you cannot measure three, just to make sure, uh, just to make it clear, you cannot measure three samples at the same time. So what we're measuring here, first we, we basically outgas solvent number one. So we open the valve, we pull the vacuum, the pressure will decrease. During the outgassing process, we remove all the air above the molecule till we reach the, 
the rates of the wave operation and uh, condensation on E2. So once we reach that state, we close the valve. Uh, we close the valve here, which will isolate the pump, and if we, the pressure inside the vacuum chamber we will reach to so saturation pressure. Once the experiment is completed, we, uh, we can repeat the same experiment on the sol using the solvent number two. So again, we first do the outgassing of the solvent, and then we close the valve and we measure the evaporation. And then we can do the same experiments for the solvent number three. And this can be done at three or four different temperatures because the evaporation rates and the vapor pressure will change uh, because of the temperature. So what it looks like, so the solvents look like this. They are connected directly uh, through the sun steel flask uh, to the vacuum valve. And then we just evaporate in the liquid. So at the bottom, what you see here is the liquid sample one. So you have the liquid sitting at the bottom. So large surface area due to larger evaporation rate, but the number of the vapor pressure and the liquid in a closed system won't change. So you don't get any losses. And then you have the second liquid sitting at the bar. Now, I show first let me, let me show you now to the example of the measure. Now, the static vapor pressure method is direct measurement of the pressure. So that's an effusion method, which is gravity method, is indirect. So, so in this case, once we have done the vertically outgassing, so we close the valve and we observe the vapor pressure. So here's the vapor pressure of cyclohexan at 25 degrees, which was 98.34 Celsius. Another example is a uh, vapor pressure of an octane at 40 degrees, and the vapor pressure is about 31.94. Now we can measure also vapor pressure of, let's say, quite highly volatile compound like vapor pressure of cyclopentane at 37.9 degrees, and this vapor pressure is about 511 torr, which is about 668.2 kilopascal. Another example is vapor pressure of the perfluorodecaline. At 25 degrees, and its vapor pressure is about 27. As you can see, it's very straightforward the method for the vapor pressure measurement. Also, the main benefit of this method is that it can be applied to the mixtures with uh, the different molecular weights distributions. So, in this case, we look at the oligomers. So, we the system allows you to measure the multiple samples. So, in this case, sample one, we have a vapor pressure of 4.9, 4.9 torr. Then you re-outgas the vapor pressure sample 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 as well. Now, so this comes to my slides. So I just in to in conclude conclusion. Uh, I hope I show you enough data to convince you that the both static and not and fusion methods are powerful methods to measure the vapor pressure of uh, various substances, varying from the liquids to solids. And lastly, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, Vlad. That was uh, very enlightening. Uh, we have our first question here, but before we get into that, I would just like to remind our audience that there are two ways to submit your questions. Please do, throw, do so in writing through the questions tab, or you can raise your hand and ask the question over the microphone directly to Dr. Martins himself. So please do so now while we're addressing this other question. Uh, just for now, Vlad, we have the question, what is the best method to measure vapor pressure of volatile materials? So the best, that's a really good question. So the best method to measure the vapor pressure of volatile material is the static method, because the evaporation rates at ambient temperatures are very high and is, it is the easiest way to do the measurement because for the static method, we will, uh, for nuts and fusion method, the sample will be evaporating fast before we will be able to measure, able to obtain any measurable data before obtaining any good vapor pressure data. So, static method is the method of the choice. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a hand raised by Takayuki to uh, Toyomasu. Uh, so, uh, Takeyuki, I will unmute your microphone now, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question. We can see you're unmuted, Takeyuki, but we can't hear you.
Okay, we'll just give him a moment to arrange his um, his microphone. In the meantime, we have another question submitted. Um, oh no, that's just a, a, a thank you from the audience, Vlad, rather than a question. <laughs> so, um, Takayuki, Takayuki, are you able to um, ask your question? It looks like he, he might be having trouble with his microphone. Um, if he is able to, if you're if you're able to hear us, Takuki, please do um, submit your question in the questions panel, and we will address it there. If you want to submit there, uh, a question has just come in, Vlad, from a Jason Perman, who also says thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and Jason asks, are there any solvents to where you can't measure the vapor pressure? Oh. Well. This is the this is the good question. So the we can measure only vapor pressure of solvents which have the vapor pressure within the range given by the measuring method. So if the vapor pressure of the solvents is highly volatile, uh, then and it is outside of our measuring range. So let's say it's above one bar or hundred thousand pascal. We might not be, we won't be able to measure it because it's going to be too high for our apparatus. So in general, we can measure the vapor pressure of the solvents using either on a static or then on that same method, depending on the uh, solvents characteristic, which will be defined by the boiling point and also by the molecular weight. So in general, we can measure most of the solvents, but as I said, it all depends whether it's going to be fit within the vapor pressure range is interested in. Okay, and would that be the same for an ionic solution, uh, Jason's asked? The ionic solution, the way we can measure the vapor pressure of the, uh, we should be able to measure the vapor pressure of the, uh, I'm not sure what's the vapor pressure of the ionic solution. So, I mean, in theory, the best way to just to try if it's, let's say, if, it's, uh, if the vapor pressure is going to be up to one bar, so we should be able to measure it. Or if the vapor pressure, I measure the ionic liquids in the past, and ionic liquids got extremely low vapor pressure. So if you talk about ionic liquids, so the vapor pressure needs to be measured using the Axenet fusion method because it is uh, extremely low, so we can measure, easily measure it. If you're measuring the ionic solution, so this must be probably done in using the static method because vapor pressure might be probably higher than 100 pascals. So I'm not sure what, uh, so what, what vapor pressure do you expect, let's say 25 degrees for this uh, solution? Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we'll just wait a few more minutes for any more questions to be submitted. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in, Vlad. So I think we can, uh, we can finish up there. Thank you again to our audience for being with us today engaging on this webinar. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add before we finish, Vlad? Uh, no, I just would like to thank you to all our attendees that have found the time to join this webinar. And if they have any questions uh, regarding the measurements or they would like to try to measure vapor pressure of the samples, either solids or liquids, they should get in touch and uh, we can have a discussion. And if possible, I'm uh, happy to do some preliminary work for, for proof of concept. And once again, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Vlad, for a great presentation. Yes, just uh, further to what Vlad said, if anyone has any uh, any requests for any more information about what's been discussed today or wants to engage in uh, taking some vapor pressure measurements, please do contact us at science at surface measurement systems dot com. And we also invite you to attend all our upcoming educational events. We have two more webinars coming this month, one focused on BET surface area measurements by, Zor uh, by Zorchen methods at ambient conditions, and this will be taking place in one week from today. And we will also be having a webinar on the moisture sorbent and dry kinetic by DBS analysis, which will be taking place in two weeks' time, two to three weeks' time. Uh, you can find out more about these on our website www.surfacemeasurementsystems.com and you can find more info on those there in the webinars page.
Thank you again to all of our attendees for joining us today, and we hope wherever you are, you have a wonderful afternoon, evening, or possibly even morning. Thank you all, and take care. Thank you, John.